Hi everyone, my name is Jim Morgan and I'm the Producing Artistic Director of the ever so virtual York Theatre Company. This is the 24th presentation in the York Theatre Show and Tell series, which revisits notable York productions and brings the people who created them back together for a virtual reunion. Some little pandemic tried to interrupt the York's 50th anniversary celebration, but we realized that this series is a great way to continue marking that milestone. We are delighted to share these shows and the people who created them with you. We've celebrated all sorts of shows from Anyone Can Whistle to Beggar's Holiday. You can find all of these programs on the York Theater's YouTube channel. Subscribing to our channel costs absolutely nothing and does great things for both of us. You'll be able to access all of our events simply and easily, and it helps build the York Theater's following in today's all important social media world. As if COVID wasn't enough, on January 4th, a Lexington Avenue water main break devastated much of our space, our archives, our equipment, and our lives. We have had to vacate our space for the first time in 30 years for an indefinite period of time while it is being remediated, reconstructed, and repaired. It's been quite a difficult time with one thing after another. We're expecting the locusts to arrive next week. Your donations are always essential in keeping our pandemic programming going, and at this time they are crucial. We want to keep these events free, and to do that, we depend on your generosity. We have lots in store for you during the new year as we revisit other shows in this series, such as Rothschild and Sons, A Doll's Life, Texas and Paris, and more. Various other virtual events will be happening throughout the coming months. Our new program, In the Pipeline, in which we talk to writers about their works in development, will take place throughout the season. More on that later and other upcoming highlights. A word to the wise, mark April 18th in your calendars for a very special event. April 18th, three days after tax day. Also remember that throughout the program tonight, you can type questions or comments into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen and we will do our best to answer them when we find time. The show we are celebrating tonight, A Taste of Things to Come, was presented in 2016 on the York Theatre stage. We've reunited members of the cast and the creative team and some special guests for not tonight's discussion. But first, I'd like you to meet my cohorts and co-hosts. Our Associate Artistic Director, Jerry McIntyre, wonderful director, choreographer, and performer, you probably saw him performing at the big We're Back celebration in Times Square last week. And my other pandemic partner, Charles Wright, our resident theater historian. Charles is writing a book about the first 50 years of the York Theater Company, and he also happens to be the co-president co of the Drama Desk. The show concerns four women who've grown up together in Winnetka, Illinois, and meet weekly to cook, socialize, and let down their studiously coiffed hair. In the first act, which takes place in 1957, they're young adults trying to hold on to their dreams despite the social conservatism of the Eisenhower era. In the second act, set in 1967, the four are back together after falling out and years of estrangement. Patching up their differences, the women assess the effects of time and maturity and they realize that comradeship, trust, and being what you want to be, plus some frivolity, are what makes life worth living. And it's certainly a perfect show to be talking about now in a month celebrating women, a cast that is all female and written by two women with a female director and music director. So we're delighted to have all of those people with us tonight and, uh, Charles, are you up for starting the discussion? I'll be happy to. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, November 2016 was a, um, a noteworthy time uh, in the uh, life of our nation and also in um, 
the life of our uh, director, Lauren Latara. Lauren, would you say a few words about um, the uh, uh, rehearsal period and what came after? Well, I mean, the the day that I can say, Allison, you guys remember this day, I don't know, but the day that Trump got elected, I showed up early and sort of was like, I have to hold it together and not cry. And then I just remember one by one, the cast came in with tears in their eyes. And Hi. we- Are you okay. telling you? But, but the significance of that day was that it was the first preview. Yes. Wow. Yes. yes. We had to right. Oh, right. Right. Yep. Right. It was the first preview. One that morning at like 3 a.m. or whatever it was. And I was going to sleep and waking up thinking I must be dreaming. And then the girls came in one by one to rehearsal, the women, the cast members, Billy and all of us. And we just sat. I remember just, I was like, let's, let's just talk for a little bit, talk this out before we try and run rehearsal. And we just sat at the edge of the stage, our feet dangling over, and we just sort of all had a good collective cry and just we talked for, what do you think guys, like two hours. And then we went yeah. back to rehearsal and we had a show. Yeah. And of course, one of the last lines of the show, Deb, you want Holly, do you want to remind us what those lines were that were supposed to be sort of and buoyant well, and delicious. It, and, you know. it, it, predicts, it predicts Hillary Clinton, the first woman to be president. And it says, uh, um, they, she makes a toast, Joan makes a toast and, uh, you know, here's to, this is America, here's to being anything we want to be, maybe even president. I maybe even president. Mm -hmm. And and I, I, was, I was mentioning too, and then I'll let Deborah talk too, but when I first, 10 years before, you know, which that's how long it takes to get a musical up when I first started thinking of the project, even before Deborah came in and made it so wonderful. But I, I predicted uh, the first black president, which was Obama, when the whole time when I was first working on the first few drafts, uh, Connie, Connie, one of the characters, little boy was biracial and they had left the country because in the 60s. And so the girls at the end, the same thing, they were singing at the end of In Time, they were raising their glasses to make a toast. It's America. Come on back, to Connie. He can be whoever he wants to be. Maybe he can be president. And that was supposed to oh be. Oh my God. Hillary. And so after 10 years and, and whatever Deborah and I were working on the show, we suddenly had to write the ending in four hours or in two hours. And we did it with everybody's help. Let me, let's take just a minute to meet everyone who's on the panel right now. We can come back and hear from everyone in detail, but I wanted to just so people are not sitting there uh, wondering who everyone is. So uh, uh, who should we start with? Uh, well, Lauren, since uh, Lauren, our director, Lauren Lataro, uh, real quickly, where are you? What are you up to? And we'll go on to other people. We'll come back to everyone. <laughs> Great. Hi, I'm Lauren. I'm home in New York City. We live in Greenwich Village. Uh, I was working on Mrs. Doubtfire and The Visitor and La Traviata, and it all just oh was pretty crazy. And um, I've been here pretty much since. My husband is a doctor. He ended up having to work COVID. So 48 hours later, we were like all leaving the house with the baby and he was going to stay here. It was insane. But then that all finished and we've just He's been working and I've been um, trying to enjoy the baby and working on the projects. And the two creators of the show, Holly, we've heard from Holly, but just introduce yourself and where are you and what are you up to? And then I'm Holly Levin, co-writer with Deborah Barsha on book music lyrics. And right at this moment, I'm in a garage in Palm Desert, California, Echo and I, I um, over, uh, pretty much was working on uh, something in Chicago in November, uh, a new play musical and kind of making uh, plans to see where we go next. And then the you know pandemic hit and I holed up in my studio in Venice and was trying to write music and you know be hopeful. And during that time, I also um, converted an old garage in Palm Desert, California into a music studio. And I'm working on some new projects, including a really cool one with a, a young artist who's 19, who's like a young Prince or Michael Jackson, we hope. And 
just keeping busy with music right now. Deborah Barsha. Hello. I'm Deborah Barsha, and I am the co writer with Holly Levin of A Taste of Things to Come. And um, right before the pandemic happened, uh, I was playing Piano for Tina, the Tina Turner musical. And um, that was amazing. But the same week, I was in day four of um, a 29 hour workshop for Radiant Baby, my other show, which is getting reproduced. And um, yeah. So we were right in the middle of our workshop and I was playing Tina at night and it, then it just all went. But that is going forward. That one's going forward, which is really exciting. Um, during the pandemic, I got really, I felt like I wanted to give back. So I wrote a song uh, called We're Still Here. I don't know if uh, you saw it. Yeah, on okay. YouTube, it was for all the healthcare workers. And I did that back in, in, in April, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And mm. I used some of the cast from Tina and some of my pals, George Clinton from Parliament Funkadelic and all these people. And we came together and a lot of hospitals said they were playing the video for, for their staff to keep them going. That was great. And then we decided to give back again. I wrote the song with Sheila Ray called Turn It All Around about getting women out to vote. So I just kept dealing with what the issues were happening and trying to be creative during that time, you know, that nothing was happening. And um, yeah, that's what, what I've been doing. And I've been uh, recently getting more projects now. People are starting to rev up now and, and come back and say, hey, will you do this? Will you do that? We all had to figure out so much, but yeah, I, I think of a taste of things to come all the time. And uh, after, I don't know if you know this, Jim, but after Broadway in Chicago, we got um, published by Sam French. Yes. So, yeah. Very so exciting. Really good. Yeah. Very we exciting. At the end of this, have to talk about the impact of of that of the, not only the election on the uh, during the first night of the previews, but in Chicago. By the time you know the little time had passed, and how that that had an impact on the the end of the show, um, in terms of hopefulness and. Anyway, so we'll talk about that later, but there's some great, great new, exciting things happening, I think, along those lines. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Awesome. That's very exciting. Lauren, did we miss a family member of yours? That was, yes, rushing in here. <laughs> Any chance of getting her back? Oh, sure, hold on. Arden, Daddy, can you bring Arden in? Everyone wants to meet her. And then Stacy will go to you. Stacy Levine. Hi, Stacy Levine. I was the producer of A Taste of Things to Come. I am uh, here on the Upper West Side, um, where I've been since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, left my office in Times Square. Oh my gosh, there's oh. Arden. Let, can we well, let's stop and yeah. say hi to Arden? Oh, that's hi, 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 Arden. Hi. 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 <laughs> can you He's can gorgeous. Hey, hello. <laughs> You're not a princess, right? <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. You want to say bye? Good night, Arden. Good night, Arden. Good night. Bye bye. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, Stacy, back to you. Sorry. So, yeah, so. I've been here on the Upper West Side. Um, you know, lots of transition. Uh, vacated my office in Times Square soon after when we knew what was, you know, there wasn't a lot going on. Uh, I was in the middle of two tours. I had a tour for a stage show for Lisa Lampanelli, who was uh, transitioning from being a stand-up to doing a stage show and also a concert tour for Mandy Patinkin. And so those sort of, you know, uh, we dealt with the aftermath of all of that. Um, I have been working on a couple new things. Um, one that I can talk about right now is a podcast that I'm working on with a young actor and director named Josh Johnston, who happens to be Patti Lapone's son. And he and I have created what's called Radio Play Revival. And we're doing old school radio plays. And um, we're really excited. Our first one, uh, we've done the yellow wallpaper with, had Jessica Chastain and Michael Urey. Um, record we did Zingu by Edith Wharton with an amazing cast of Anna Devere Smith, Bridget Everett, Eva Marie Saint, um, Blair Brown, Harriet Harris, Catherine Grody, and Charles Bush. So 
we've been having a lot of fun casting these amazing radio plays and they'll be coming to a podcast near you. And then my goal is to put them on stage. Um, but that's in lots of things in development, keeping really busy, trying to, you know, uh, just sort of reinvent the wheel a little bit. And now that we're coming back, I'm excited to sort of mesh the reinvention with what I was doing before. So, and of course, taste holds a big place in my heart because, you know, this was us. This is what we did. So, I'm well, so we'll get into how it all happened and who did what uh, uh, in a little bit. Let's continue meeting with everyone. Ms. Berkowitz, our music director. Hi, everyone. Oh, it's so good to see everyone. Um, I had the honor of music directing this brilliant musical that it was so fun to play. It's such a treat to play this. It was such a treat. It was so clever. Both of you guys, everybody, I just, guys, it was a blast every day and it was an honor. Um, before COVID, I was in previews for the Lehman trilogy. Um, and then we were told, Deborah, I bet you were too. Um, we were told that Broadway would be reopening in three weeks, come back in two weeks. So I left for Boston with about two weeks of stuff. <laughs> and I uh, am still here in Boston uh, with my family. And um, I've done a couple of streaming musicals. Um, who remembers their first Zoom rehearsal? <laughs> that was so crazy. <laughs> Um, and working on uh, some projects. I've been playing a lot of, um, before the weather got cold, I was doing a lot of outdoor like club date events. And then when it got cold, kind of had to shut down. And now I'm kind of setting up out here in Boston for a lot more of that and have some projects going, but um, trying to stay creative, but seeing all these faces right now, it's just making me excited and inspired again. So there it is. <laughs> Wonderful. And we have two of our cast members with us tonight. And uh, um, uh, let's go alphabetically. Uh, Allison Gwynn. Hi. I'm greetings from Astoria, where it's I can hear everything my downstairs neighbor does. So if he interrupts us at any point in time, <coughs> that's him. Uh, yay. I have been. Uh, the a professional hermit for for almost a year now here in New York City. I've learned to play the dulcimer, the mountain dulcimer. Um, I to right before the um, the pandemic started, I had just left the Les Mis Les Miserables national tour playing Madame Thenardier for a couple years. So that's always been a dream role of mine. So it was. I jumped to do that and uh, then I was ready to start, get back to New York and, and really, you know, go audition and I got a voiceover agent and uh, I was ready to go and then everything stopped. So um, that's, that's what happens though. Uh, me and a friend that I had met uh, on tour, she was on the Les Mis tour with me, we'd been, uh, we, passing songs back and forth via the acapella app and we formed kind of like a a little folk group we call Cormac and Gwyn where we we do old time country and sometimes um we did a murder ballad series because I'm Appalachian and uh so we've been uh trying to keep creative that way um yeah it's just taking what you can and rolling with it. So that's what I've been doing. That's great. And Autumn Herbert. Um, oh my gosh, I have such good memories of this show, but we'll get to that. Um, so when the last job I did before uh, COVID happened, uh, I was in really hard place in Florida, the Maltz Jupiter, playing Edwin Drood and having a blast. Um, and then I came back and I was recording a concept album and I was working on a new show and I was, um, uh, I had a big birthday and I saw the Celine Dion concert and I saw the Glenn Doyle book release and I took a vacation to Westchester to have a spa vacation and I saw the preview of 
um, this is Doubtfire, and I was literally in the most public spaces I possibly could have been just, uh, you know, the day before everything shut down. Um, so then I spent the ensuing weeks, you know, analyzing every sniffle and, you know, whatever, and, um, but everything was fine. Um, and so I kind of went from full-time hustle to full-time uh, mute DJ for remote kindergarten. <laughs> and I don't know if any of you know what remote schooling is like for children, but just do that for a kindergartner. <laughs> so I've, lost, I've lost my mind. Um, no, I'm kidding. It's actually been, um, you know, silver linings to spend this time with my kid has been, you know, really, really special um, and time that we wouldn't have had. And we actually bought a car and took a cross country road trip and saw all of our, safely saw all of our, all of his grandparents, like a ton of our family. Um, and that was like in the summer before it really started popping up everywhere. And um, so we've had some good, we had some good things coming out of it. Um, and I first say I'm in New York uh, on the Upper West Side. Um, yeah. And what age is your kid? He's about to turn six. He's, poor thing, is about to have his second uh, COVID birthday. So he turns six on April 24th, but he's the best sport. And he is um, very excited for his birthday. He knows it has to be a very small gathering outside with masks. And so he just, <laughs> the other day we said, you know, do you want balloons outside? You know, we kind of started talking about it. He goes, yeah, yeah, no, it's gonna be fun. But for my seventh birthday, can we get a bouncy house? <laughs> he goes, can I have all of my friends and my whole, why don't we invite the whole school? I mean, a birthday is fun for everybody, no matter how old they are, right? So everybody can, <laughs> I was so like, he's oh, he's an future. extrovert. Yes, yes. Sounds yeah. wonderful. Uh, what's his name? His name is Lincoln. Lincoln. Yes. Um, Jerry Mack, uh, did you see this show? No, I didn't see the show, but I read it and, and I loved the, I loved reading it, but I, and I love watching this clip. And hi, Lauren. Yours, I mean, your work is so fabulous in this. It's oh. so great. It's so great. I mean, it, I mean, as a choreographer, I'm like. I know that challenge you have in the, in that kitchen to make all those numbers work in that one play. It's really fantastic, my love. I was so I was so I was like you know when she put the uh, spoon in her mouth as a cigar. I was like yes, Jesus. <laughs> lovely, it's such great work, Lauren. And I think we met we met with maybe Matt Lenz. Yeah. Years ago, I think yeah. with Matt Lenz or Jackie Miller, my daughter, or something. So it's just good to see you again. Congratulations. Oh. Thank you. We had so much fun creating the show, right? I, I mean, we really did. It was a very, very creative process. I think the cast members had a lot to do with it. Deb and Holly had a million ideas. Stacy was very generous with time and space. And we just, right, Gillian? I mean, we just, we had fun. We just, we were silly and um, wow. we just, you know, tried to do as much as we could and change it up with every number and, you know, we had fun creating this. I got the call from my agent, Michael Finkel. We met with Stacy. Stacy and I hit it off. And then Holly and Deb, we had a, one meeting and they said, we're going to send you the script and then let us know what you think. And then I went home and I read the script and listened to the music a couple of times and took notes, you know, as you do. And then we had our next meeting. And I remember it like this, Deb and Holly, you tell me, but I remember... Um, for one of the songs, I said, oh, I just see like sunglasses and the women like pushing, you know, carts like they're in the grocery store with their, you know, like spies with their sort of jackets on. And I think after that, you, you guys were like, all right, let's do this. <laughs> yeah, we both, we both like, we agreed right then. Yeah, that was right. I said, oh, my God, spies in the yeah. kitchen with sunglasses yeah. and raincoats. <laughs> was that, did you hear? Was that the yeah. song? Yes. Yeah. We had, yeah. That's my favorite never thought of it like that. Yeah, we will and, have a clip of that. And um, my favorite autumn is when you pop you when you pop yourself up on the counter. <laughs> I love it. I loved it. The whole thing was so good. It was so fun. Oh, and so precise. It took us a minute to get all that. Well, maybe maybe we should take since we're talking about it, maybe we should take a minute now and show it. Let's go ahead and watch Did You Hear? Yeah. 
gossiping? It's not gossip, it's news. If we don't gossip, what are we gonna do? It is our civic duty to know what is happening with our neighbors. I'm just doing my part. Okay, what'd you hear? I was rolling around the grocery store, three aisles from the soup. The soup, now you know me. I keep to myself. I never been one to snoop. To snoop. I was minding my own business. Uh-huh. Not like I really care. Right. But did you know that Tom and Jane and Dick are having an affair? No. Did you hear? Did you hear? Ooh. What did you hear? Come on, tell us. What did you say? If they ask where did you hear and you did, you gotta swear. You didn't hear it from me. Well, I was sitting on a stool all counter having a root beer float, root beer float. behind the Maybelline and the Aquanet. I saw Eddie G slip Johnny P a note into his coat. So just a rumor, I should mention it. Come on, but okay, if you insist, we insist. I'm not saying it's true, but you know who is a communist. Oh, oh Red, did you hear? Did you hear? What did you hear? Come on, tell. Get this girl I was born into the S O on main picking up the bag of lucky strips. the last out of the corner of her eyes, she saw Father O'Neill stumbling out of dirty mics. Oh God, girls, we've wasted 15 minutes Whoops. with all this drivel and crap. It's not crap. But I was under the dryer at Jack de Paris when I heard Mark Kent's got the clap. Great. That was wonderful. That was great. Charles, maybe you'd like to put us back on track since I did. Well, well, I'll try. Um, <laughs> one of the striking things about this show is uh, that the four characters are um, extremely well and clearly delineated. And in case we have um, viewers who uh, didn't see the show, um, could we uh, talk a little bit about those four characters and what they represent? First, we should say that the play is set in 1957 and then in 1967. Um, Deborah and Holly, could you just say a little bit about that structure? And then uh, we'll, I hope uh, the other people on the, on the panel will uh, talk a little bit about these four uh, really interesting uh, characters. I'll let Deborah start about the character development. Okay, but if you want to start cover. about it, it's actually your con original conception. So, do you want to start there about finding your mother? What happened? Uh, yeah. Okay. So the 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 lead so-called lead character, even though it's an ensemble piece, Joan was loosely based around my mom, who um, uh, unfortunately passed away young. And um, anyway, she had left this sort of big chest of things. And one day I was going through it and I found the Betty Crocker cookbook um, and I could almost like, it just brought back not only emotional memories, but even the smells in the kitchen. And I, I found these little books, um, what were they called again? Oh yeah, uh, Joe, Joe Bonomo, um, how to make a better personality and how, you know, how to um, how simplify your housekeeping and all these things. And, I, and my, the baby book when she was pregnant with my brother and how the stork brings the baby. And I wanted to know more about that. And as I started to do it, I always knew sort of I wanted to make a, a show out of it and want, because I wanted her to come alive again. I wanted to see her in the kitchen with her friends. And I realized as I got older and also became a mom, but that the kitchen was kind of like the locker room was for boys in the sense that women couldn't really talk about 
uh, we certainly couldn't talk about politics or sex or, but in the kitchen, of course, we didn't know what was going on, but you know, that's where they could and that's where they were safe. Um, and, and then I, when Deborah and I discussed these other four characters, I mean, the other three characters sort of based on my mother's friends, um, all who came from very different backgrounds and each had their own secret in a way I realized. Um, um, but the friendship and, and the camaraderie in the kitchen and the, the making something with your own hands and the love and feeling important, feeding your family, feeling important in the kitchen, creating something, which is only where they could do it. So Deborah can talk about the other women and how we balanced it all out. She had a lot more experience theater and developing characters and also being an actress herself. And it was really, really helpful in helping me define them and get them out of my head and get them onto paper. Yeah, it was great. And uh, Holly, I was, I just got so blown away. Holly originally asked me just to arrange the vocals for the piece. And when I read it, I started to read the, I, I said, oh, please, can I write this with you? Please, can I write this with you? And that it was great. Um, and so then um, when we did, it's very interesting, uh, Dottie, was a very interesting character. And I think as time has passed, especially with what happened this year uh, and all the racial tensions, the stuff that's in the piece now kind of resonates, you know, oh. it's, it's really intense, you know? Yeah, big time, I've been thinking about that. Yeah, I've been thinking about it too, um, because it started, you know, that was when, um, well, Dottie, Dottie's character isn't coming from a place of, of being a racist. <laughs> Or being, but, able, being anything. Right, just what right. Know. But this is just the way kind of it was. And we're looking so much into history now and what happened and taking accountability. If <laughs> that character is really resonating with you now in a really big way. I mean, if you want to talk about that, Allison, too, when you're when you're talking, it would be really great. Um, and so Dottie's kind of the Phyllis Schlafly. And then the Phyllis Schlafly movie came out. Did you guys see it? Where she was responsible. Oh, yeah kind of for not having the ERA pass, not just her, but she she spearheaded a whole movement saying, what's wrong with being a housemaker, a house, <laughs> you know, yeah, wife. I, I don't want to be a feminist, you know, and made feminism like a bad word kind of a mm -hmm. thing. So that's the Dottie character, but she, all these characters 10 years later learn so much. And what they really learn is that friendship is the most important thing. That women and friendship, that is, the beautiful thing about and this. listening to each other and listening, listening to, yes uh connie connie was a great character because she's pregnant and she has her own secret i mean it's we, we can say the spoiler now because we're oh, not yeah. doing production but you know connie has her secret about being pregnant with someone else's baby and in the 50s in those days it's it wasn't done you know so like Holly said, you know, we, we find out that about Connie. Agnes has her secret because she was adopted. She never told her friends and she's passing as, as white. And but she's like a woman. Yeah. Right. So all these issues to me, this like show is going, oh my God, this is like, this is like a whole other time, you know? And, and these characters that we developed, you know? And I just feel like um, we're at uh, being, in the kitchen represents, like Holly said, you know, everything like like a female locker room, but it also represents food, represents so much love, you know, and stuff like that. And I just feel like, you know, the kitchen is the kitchen no matter what age we're in. So that's why it was so brilliant with the set that all that changed was the style of the kitchen, but still when they had the reunion and came back together, they still wanted to be in that space. And what I loved is that I insisted, and Holly was like, you're right, it has to happen. I said, they have to have an all-female band. And this was in the time before um, Maestra, which is now happening and where people are saying we have to have female musicians. I said, because we have to show them how far we've come. You know, that, that now we can find female musicians to, to be in the orchestra as well. That was considered still like, wow, yeah, female musicians. So that's why there's like this reveal in the second act too that you could actually see all the women on stage, you know. So that's that's that. Go ahead, Charles. Let me introduce. Let, let me interrupt for a minute and uh, uh, let's watch a clip of the opening number, which really kinds of set kind of sets up the tone of the whole show. Uh, here we go. Here's let's cooking. cooking. We may not all be five star chefs. We do our best. But since Stop 
Awesome. You know, you reminded me what Holly and I uh, subject, objective was that those days women didn't sing those kind of like a little Richard and you know we wanted to put those that kind of you know song in women's mouths that we never heard from women. So at that period, you know, so that that just reminded me of it. Thank you. Oh good. That, that was so good to see that. One little does that strike you that way? The the, the uh, uh, unusualness of hearing women singing that kind of music? Oh, I mean, first of all, Janet calls my goddess. So <laughs> anything she sings is divine. And that voice is so pristine. It's so gorgeous. I love it so much. I mean, and listening to, you know, the, the clips I saw, it's just so fantastic so fantastic and you guys were really triple threats in that thing because you guys were dancing and singing and then they acted fantastically it's amazing just so great yeah, and using the props and the set and everything charles yeah. back to you for the for the win one of the things i love in the show is the references to cultural touchstones there's so many and you saw it in the the scenic design there with the tide box and other um, other uh, labels and brand names. Um, Holly and Deborah, what were you trying to get at with the um, uh, with those the particular uh, cultural references? I mean, I mean there, there's a great many that are interesting and in that uh, uh, show the contrast between 1957 and 1967. From Betty Crocker to Betty Friedan, one character says, uh, but uh, the so many of the references are written into this into this libretto and not uh, left to the designers. Uh, what did you have in mind in um, in your choice of, of cultural references? Well, Holly, um, uh, I'm going to let Holly talk, but I do want to talk about the commercials that Holly found and did so much. Oh. Holly is a research queen, I will say. Works her ass off researching things and making sure that they are really of exactly what we're looking for. And we picked those actual commercials that we showed because it it really does show how women were portrayed in the um in the fifties, like you know, with the coffee commercial. Dear, how's your coffee? Oh, you know, why is it work? You know, think this coffee is terrible. You know, it's like it's like. But it's how we were influenced. We were influenced by what we thought we were supposed to be, what we were supposed to smoke, what we were supposed to. Yeah, go ahead. No, and how everything. You know, we were told it was okay to smoke and have a drink when you're pregnant by Dr. Spock. And my mother remembers that. And that's the other thing. Our, my, re our, my research was my mother because <laughs> we would run things by my mother and say, mom, was this really true? And she said, yes, we did everything Dr. Spock said, <laughs> you know? And so many of the cultural references, she said, you know, people, that's what it was in those days. You had to get your supper on the table by the time your husband came home. There was no even talking about it. It was just what you did. Well, and there were miracle creams. And, you know, if you had the right <laughs> coffee, maybe your husband would be satisfied. And I, I do think in the line, I think in the, in the, I think it's in time, the last, in the last act, we talk about how much think, 
how things change, but they some stay the same. Yes. And how I think that we picked commercials once we got on a roll. We also and Deborah was really good about this. Is you know, you know, sometimes you know, when you find something funny or that it's really great, but you know, it has to be in the thread of the story too. It just can't be sticking out as a joke or something funny. But at least these commercials influence the women then. And, and that could do everything from make them feel like a goddess to make them feel like they were like, they would take a great cup of coffee. And of course, you know? yeah, of course, um, I we loved the York Theater putting up all the recipes in the lobby. I right, have right. to say that I right. just went up and down all those pretzel jello molds and you know everything from the 50s uh, that that women made in the kitchen i mean that set up the whole show for me that lobby gym thank you so much for that there was, was a lime animal. there was like a lime salad a lime there was something yes. yellow yes. <laughs> yeah one of the sad things when we were cleaning out after the flood um was finding those things and they were damaged, but I say uh, because they were not destroyed and they just meant so much. They, and I thought we may have a use for these or at least we can, I don't know. Uh, I, it, I didn't have the heart to throw them out. Uh, and you had the great cocktails, the cocktails too that you had. Uh, Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, hang on, Jim. Can I just ask uh, one more follow up question? In addition sure. to Dr. Spock, um, there's another uh, doctor who is quite significant to the show, Dr. Kinsey. Uh, could you say a little bit about what Kinsey meant to that era and to your characters? Um, Holly can too, but you know. Oh, Deborah's going to because she knows where I'm I, I know. Well, sex. the thing is, that everybody was waiting for the Kinsey report, you know, mm -hmm. and it was treated like it was this dry statistical book. If you ever look at the Kinsey report, but people would hide it under their bed like it was born, you know what I mean? Because nobody had ever, it's the first time women read about what percentage of women had orgasms with their husbands in the bedroom. I mean, this was like major stuff. You didn't even know what that was. <laughs> Exactly. So yeah, Alfred Kinsey, when that came out, the Kinsey report, it like blew wide open everything. And of course we have a couple of food metaphors there because Holly really educated me about the blues. Holly was a blues guitar player. And she said, you know, in act two, when we do food and we come back for 1967, everybody's sexually free because of that um, 10 year gap. And they're now singing about how they want to make food, but it's all about sex. And, and they're stoned. And they're, stoned. <laughs> and, they're, and they're smoking pot. See, now, look at our show. Now pot's legal. Can you believe yeah. this? It's like, it really is, this show, oh my God, you guys are freaking me out because it really is. Well, there's a line in there that says, boy, they should make this shit legal. Remember, right. isn't it? Uh, <laughs> this character says that, yeah. We should also people. say that the, the play is set in Winnetka, Illinois. And um, uh, the Kinsey Report, of course, came out of, Indiana University in the center of the country, not from uh, the East Coast or from Berkeley. That's right. Yeah. Mid America, I mean, that's what's the Holly was Holly's original concept. She said, we have to do it mid America. We don't want to do it coast to coast. We want to do it right in the middle of America. Well, right? they say you have to write about what you know, too. And I'm from St. Louis. Although I think where Deborah came from and uh, there is a little bit like the Midwest in some ways. But, you know, the other thing is that the song, um, it took a while. What was the name of that song? Oh, SEX. Isn't it called Sex? We actually Something's took burning. Something's burning. Something's burning. It had so many titles before, you know. <laughs> but anyway, remember that we took actual statistics from the book. It took a zoologist from Indiana, you know, with 600 volunteers and the oohs and the ahs. We actually took some of the lines, I mean, like the, the, the statistics and made them into lyrics. They were real. Uh, those, yeah, those statistics are real. We set them to music. And why did you set the play in Winnetka in particular? Or is there a reason? Well, I actually, I didn't know the significance at the time. I, the thing is I grew up, was raised and grew up in St. Louis and um, I have family in Chicago. I wanted to make it in the Midwest and I, I felt like St. Louis for me was a little too specific but I wanted to write about what I know and I wanted it to be a suburb. And as it turns out when I started researching because I have family in Chicago and I had visited there when I was a kid. So many people, well, Anne Margaret, 
That's mm-hmm. one Rock Hudson. Rock Hudson and Anne Marie. Rock, Rock, that's why we did it, ultimately, right? Because Rock yeah. Hudson, who was named, what was his name? Roy uh, Spears Spearer. or something. What we wanted the and, Agnes to relate to getting out of the suburbs. Getting out, right. And that's, that's something in St. Louis, we always say uh, getting out. It was like getting out into a bigger world. But also, um, Anne Margaret won um, the Ar- Arthur Godfrey ta- um, Amateur Hour when she Ted was Mac, 16. Ted Mack, yeah. Ted Mack, and she, I think that's, and she was an, uh, a Swedish immigrant because Sweden, there was a lot of Swedish immigrants in Chicago. And then, you know, um, what's his name? Uh, also went to nuclear, uh, Rock Hudson. It was just in Charlton Heston. This was all real. They had all come from there. And it just seemed like a wealth of, I forgot that Home Alone was filmed there. Somebody told me that John Hughes was born there. I didn't even know that when I was first doing it. Anyway, that's why I wanted to send it in the, the center. And then there was all this rich stuff of these kids that went to this high school. And got out. The got yeah, out. We use we use the real uh, New Trier High School theme anyway. Right. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, there was one person that came to the show that was a was a cheerleader with Anne Margaret. Yep. She came to New York. She was on the squad with Anne Margaret. <laughs> and there's so a all guy who's people thought we made up. It was all true. Everything was true. And there was a guy who came up to me in the lobby during one of the performances. I think I saw it, he saw it twice. He has stayed in touch from New Trier and he will sign his emails, whatever his name is, that New Trier guy. Uh, and that yeah. was the connection we made because of this show. Stacy, I wanted to ask you, how did you get enamored of this show and want to help bring it to life, bring it to the stage? Um, Deborah and Holly's agent found me and I had one meeting with the two of them and was enamored with the two of them because they their energy and enthusiasm for what they had written was so infectious and I took it home and I read it and I kind of crossed my fingers that they would like me as much as I liked them and sure enough I got a call that said yep we think we're a great fit and so the three of us just sort of started down that path of you know, their job was to continue to tweak the artistic um, portion of this venture that we were creating. And my job was to figure out where we were going to do this. And um, so it was just a, it was a work of love. I mean, we, uh, you know, all of the themes rang so true. And, um, you know, I think it's all, as women in the theater, we all sort of, dream or aspire that we can create a group of strong, powerful, independent women who we can all rely on each other and have an amazing time doing what we love. And that's what we got to do. So. Uh, let's go and watch. Uh, we have a preview reel, um, uh, which I think is very interesting. Interviews with all of the cast members um, talking about the show as it's getting ready for performances. Here we are. The show is about four women in 1957 who have a cooking club together and their friendship and what brings them together and, uh, and what they talk about. I carried the idea around for nine years and I was raising a kid and that became really important to me when I finally went through my mom's stuff and the first thing I saw was a Betty Crocker cookbook and then underneath it I saw the Dr. Spock book and then I found these little pocket manuals that taught women how to behave, how to find your man and hold him, 10 steps to the altar. We will start from scratch, Betty Crocker, meet your match. Well, the music is so much fun. We've got a wide, a very, very wide range of genres from the 50s to the 60s. Uh, the songs are really beautifully written. There's a lot of really intricate harmonies going on. I totally loved all the rock and roll songs from the 50s and 60s. There was one problem. Women weren't singing those songs. They were singing ting, 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 ting. They're very sweet songs. There were some that were, but for the most part, not. And I really wanted to with Holly, our vision was the same, to put those grooves, those rock and roll grooves in the mouths of women. I love in Act One how there's all these tight part harmonies in it and you don't get that a lot in uh, female parts of musicals. It's more sing this ballad and be really, you know, great and belt your face off and all this stuff, but it's really interesting to sing as an ensemble. 
package. It's got really, really great infectious music. Um, and there's four bad women on stage dancing and singing and giving you this beautiful story. It's set in the 1950s and 60s, but there are themes that could not be more true for today. Last time we ran it in Bucks County, people came up and said, oh my God, you can do this for the 70s, for the 80s, for the 90s. You can keep going. Women have come so far and they still have some, so far to go. Come see A Taste of Things to Come at the York because we're having a wonderful time and I really think the story that we're telling is really important, especially in the midst of this election process, having a woman who's in the forefront for candidacy for the president. Um, so uh, it's a wonderful time for women and empowerment, which is what you're going to get in the show. If you have dreams of being something big or wild or something that maybe you think is out of the realm of possibility for you, you should come see this show because it might inspire you to take that leap. Can I just say that duet with two women passes the Bechdel test? Which what test? The Bechdel, Alison Bechdel, who uh. wrote Gone Home. She, you know, you have to have a duet between two women that isn't about a man. Oh. It passes you know, the test. <laughs> Charles? Uh, you know, I just, I want to ask Deborah and Holly, uh, when I saw this show the first time, I, th I thought of um, uh, a sort of um, iconic show uh, that's written by two members of the York family, Nancy Ford and Gretchen Cryer. And I wonder, did... Um, did you have, I'm getting my act together and taking it on the road, at, in mind at all uh, as, you, as you went through your 10-year journey of, of uh, writing this, this show and dealing with these characters? I met with Gretchen, actually, um, about another project, but she, that was one of the first, I was, I always, I, I, I loved theater. Sometimes I would think it was like too corny or, or didn't relate to my world. And I remember seeing, I'm take, getting my act together and taking on the road. I don't remember, I may have even seen it in St. Louis or I don't remember where. And um, I always wanted to meet Gretchen and I always liked that, um, that the, the structure that they had. Um, but anyway, uh, I, she was always one of my favorite playwrights. So yeah, and for me, Nancy Ford came up to me when she saw the show and said, oh my God, those harmonies, those <laughs> harmonies are so, and I, it was like a total compliment. I was like, oh my God, thank you. Well, I think one reason that I thought of it, not only because of the frustrations, the conflicts that these uh, women deal with, but also because uh, Fryer and Ford have uh, written a sequel, which the York did in tandem with I'm Getting My Act Together. So uh, the sequel being, Jim, do you want to say anything about this? The sequel is I'm Still Getting My Act Together. Still Getting My Act Together, and it's the same characters 30 years later. Gretchen played her character. Um, and um, when was this? Well, we first did it in the summer. Uh, I'm guessing about eight or nine years ago, oh, wow. and then we did it a year ago as part of our 50th anniversary celebration. A revised version. They've they have done it several places and continued honing it, and they really restructured it and and told the story much more concisely and it was really played wonderfully. It has a lot of potential. Um, so it's, it's, it's another of these wonderful shows that's out there that should be done. It, it would be great as did it originally to do it in tandem with I'm getting my act together, do them both together and um, yeah. You never know. But the second show is is a sequel. Your um, two eras uh, are are really were integrated from the beginning. Right. The end of the first act is a a perfect act break. The in that the the conflict among the characters has reached such a pitch that when the when the stage lights go out, it's difficult for the audience to imagine what we're going to see when the second act begins. And in fact, 
in the course of the intermission, 10 years pass, 10 years in which the characters are estranged and act two is, is their reunion. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm interested in hearing from the actresses too, what they, what they feel like when we're watching. I was watching just gonna say them. that, yes. Part of it is like, you know, the back in the day, the first time you heard your voice on a answering machine, you're like, is this, is this an out of body experience? Is this me? Is that great? <laughs> Whoa, that's the, those are the faces that I made? <laughs> um, but aside from the vanity <laughs> aspect, um, uh, it's such a, oh my gosh, I wanna do it all over again. I, no. I, I've been so lucky once in my career to do a show twice with the same cast um, and it was Private Lives. And it's it's a wild experience because you you come at it from it's like you reach the mountaintop closing night and then you just like shoot from there and there's so much like you like Deborah has mentioned so many times that there's so many things that just hit differently now and I also think there was an aspect of we were all a little traumatized um you know we were so optimistic and I I admittedly was so naive. I was like, Hillary's gonna win. There's no way that dude's, there's no way, no way. And it was like a gut punch. And I think then, I mean, I don't know if you remember, I'm sure Allison, we've talked about this, but um, all the girls have talked about in previews when that last line, and a woman, you can be anything you put your mind to, even president. There were like visible, you know, you could hear People little cheers scary. and like satisfied, you know, it was just this excitement. And from that first preview on, it was almost like we said that line and it was like, it was just this collective sadness or hopelessness, you know? And it was these like Upper East Side women, patrons of the theater who are coming to see a show about women. And it was almost like, you know, it was, it was <laughs> getting teary thinking about it. Um, it was, I, I don't know. It, it was, it was traumatic in a way. Yeah, you we know, the same way when for, and for you guys, we wanted to put words in your mouth that yeah. were hopeful. And we were struggling as well to do that. Yeah. For you guys. Yeah. And, and I feel like it just drummed it home. You know, it was like, women always get to a certain point. And then we hit another roadblock. We hit another. Yeah, sorry. You know, <laughs> uh, and it was just like, sort yeah. of like, yeah, this isn't just the 50s or 60s or 70s or 80s or 90s or 2000s. And now it's the 10s. And now we're into the 20s. And we have a female vice president, but we still have so 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 far to go so sorry i'm droning on allison you're so bright no, and I, 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 and I, I, have I just interject so. one thing uh, our audience is not just from the upper east side we have oh, no 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 <laughs> no i just wanted to make that point <laughs> allison over to you sorry <laughs> no i i completely agree with autumn having uh i had to say that line uh maybe even president mm -hmm. and the challenge with that was it was such a joyous line before the the before times you know uh when we had we had all this hope and it was so celebratory and so exciting and and then the challenge was how am i going to say this line and the first night i said it i choked up and i'm choking up now and um <laughs> It was, the first night was the hardest because um, how do you carry on, you know? Um, not only with that line, but with everything. So it, it was really a valuable, uh, not only acting lesson, but um, what are we gonna do now? We have to rebuild as painful as everything is and as much as we just want to move, <laughs> you know, to a different country, we, we have, to, we have to go, well, that happened. Uh, let's regroup and, and do it and keep going. Uh, I have something really positive to say. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt her, but like what you're saying, Allison, that, that very night, and I think it was the, the one, the preview where we finally settled on the line, we've come too far girls now to turn back. And a woman who I did not know, but she recognized me at the end of the show because remember at the beginning, J James, you would um, 
Jim, you, you would have us uh, raise our hands, the writers and the directors in the back. So she came back to me after the show and she said, um, are you, you know, one of the writers? I said, yeah. And she said, I just want to thank you that for the last two hours, I forgot how fucked up everything was. You really uh, made me, you know, forget. And thank you. Yeah. And that was like, as a writer, I mean, and that's, so she was, even as the audience was feeling like, well, we had this little respite of hope. And thank yeah. you for giving me at least that. That's what she was saying. Yeah. Well, I was going to say too, as traumatic as it was, um, you know, earlier Lauren spoke about how that next day we came in and we did, we talked for hours and we cried and cried and but kind of held each other and challenged each other. And, and that was the, that was the theme is that, this is this is going to be a traumatic time for our country but we have this little window this piece of art that is cathartic and hopeful and is about friendship and love and strength and we're here to sort of lean into that and i feel i feel so lucky that we were doing that then because i don't know what i would have done if i wasn't in a show like that, and I was just sitting at home worrying about what the disaster in the next four years were going to be. But mm -hmm. we, like, we had us, we had eight shows a week to come together and lean into our like divine femininity and give laughter and hope to audiences and especially each other. And that kick-ass band, and you know, you couldn't, you couldn't help but feel yeah. at least a little better every night even yeah. with that ending <laughs> and it was the song yeah. itself in time the song itself is hope I love that you call this this little piece of art because it was and it was hopeful to be doing art at that time and you oh, yeah. still and the way that you wrote the end and I remember with that new line there was a I think there was there was a little pause and we had to figure out what the right amount was to not make it like Oh, but yeah. to keep it yeah, <laughs> really we're working on that <laughs> oh that and then after you know 10 years or seven years of working on something and to have in a few hours and a few days but yeah I agree remember we I think we, we took each night to make it a little bit different until it hit home it took, it took a little bit yeah. yeah can I ask you guys a question because I only read it and when I read the end of the first act, when Connie says, you know, that she's uh, having a baby and it's probably going to be black, what was the audience reaction? Be because I, 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 I know the audience. I mean, I just, I've done, I choreographed Memphis and it was in Long Island. And when, uh, you know, Huey, the two lead characters, the white guy and the black girl kissed, the audience, I, the, their hearts fell to the, like you could feel the, like the ground open. And I never thought that would happen. You know, it was like, it was three years ago. It was like, I was just surprised that people thought a black person and a white person kissing was odd. So I just wondered mm -hmm. what did, was there a thing at the end of the first, like would people, the audience members, were, were they just, just went along with it? Was there silence? Was there, and people like to, you know, to move around and they get anxious. What was the- I think, you know, the ending, especially it's interesting that you just read it because but, um, that you know you only got to read it because the ending is of that act is so it's so brilliant because so much happens and it's like the whole facade just falls off so it's not just the issue of Connie having a baby it's the fracturing of friendships it's you it you feel mm -hmm. a very clear movement of time the music is huge and I think that it was crafted in such a way directorial and directorially in the way you guys wrote it in that um, it is, it, there's so much going on and it is so funny that I think the audience was able to embrace it because they were just rooting for whatever came next. I think in a way it was almost like, you know, it's like how you teach kids. You don't put anything on it. You don't put any expectation on it and you just give them this little gift and they're like, I got a banana for Christmas. This is great. I love it. <laughs> I don't know what it means. <laughs> I think also <laughs> that it was like a, that, like a betrayal. Like Connie, I mean, sorry, like um, Dottie felt like it was a betrayal. Not only did she yeah. not tell her she was pregnant with someone else, but oh my gosh, a betrayal in the sense of, again, her um, unconscious bias or whatever it is that she has. It's like, wait, and it's a black baby? And I, I think that 
um, you know, because it's based on a true story. And it, I, I do think that some people in the audience kind of smiled. There was like this, whoa, oh, I should have seen that coming kind of thing. Some yeah. people, I don't, I don't know. It was well, great. There was a lot going on at that, that moment. At that moment, there was so much going on. No, I just Nelson. think that um, the way Autumn played Connie, which was so, um, she was in the way very like a child and almost like our little sister. And we, you know, especially Dottie, I think, wanted to treat her like a child or as a little sister. And when, you know, she finds out this, oh, this yeah. um, that she's been betrayed or that she, she has done something that she morally doesn't agree with. Uh, it's, it's, it's uh, mama's mad. Um, but <laughs> I think Connie's character uh, represents um, really what it was like to be, oh, uh, every woman, like a person from now thinking about being in the fifties. Like it's, it was, the way you approached it with discovery and, and innocence and and um I thought that was really gorgeous and something that the audience could attach themselves to emotionally. So yeah, so that's uh it's funny when she says it's black but then everyone laughs but then they're like, Oh honey, you're trapped in this neighborhood with these people like Dottie who don't understand. You know? oh. Um wow. So oh, it was, it was, it was really special to and then, see. And then what about the contest? Fuck the contest, right? Fuck the contest. Evolution. Fuck the contest. Yeah. Right, right. Let's, let's take a minute. We have some great photographs of the show. Um, it'll bring back some memories and of various moments. Oh, that's a great shot. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, girl. Subtle, it. subtle. Yeah. I love you, Allison. Oh, I, love it. I, I always think about the turtle. <laughs> the turtle <laughs> I forgot about the turtle. The, turtle. It's in the end of the world. I remember in the middle of the night thinking of, but for the turtle it is. In, in the middle of the night in, in Venice, getting up oh. and laughing. <laughs> the, the you turtle. look so good. That looks, Autumn, that oh. looks good. really good on you. <laughs> I know, yeah. I'm like, should I dye my 60s. hair <laughs> I love those 60s a Brazilian blowout. Oh, I love yeah, it. The couch moment, oh my gosh, look. Oh. <laughs> Perfection. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love Thanks it. The dog. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fantastic. Wow. That's a good wow. shot. Too. Still we mentioned leave. the scenery was by Steve Kemp. The uh, costumes are by Dana Burkhart. Yeah. Dana and the lighting is Nathan Joyer. Perfect. Oh, fabulous work on all So fronts. gorgeous. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> that oh my is. gosh. Oh. Can I get some of those pictures? <laughs> yeah, can we get some of these yeah. pictures? <laughs> I know, I want all of these. Dana's costume. In the remember, second remember, oh my gosh, Janet's costume oh, with the sheer, the chiffon. Look at the beanbag chair. I remember the beanbag oh, chair. The bean bag. shag rug. Look at the shag rug. Coming back. Beanbag chairs I are actually coming. want that couch. Yes. <laughs> yes. I have I pictures of Lincoln when he was like not even two jumping on that beanbag. I said, would you remember the, the girls? The, the name of the band was the Spatch Roulettes. And, I, and that yes. was Stephen Kemp. There's Stephen that Kemp band. Yeah. Yeah, that last yeah. picture there, that's the second act where it opened up yes. and we saw the band. Let's do the walk. So rad. Yeah. And we have a clip of that. Oh no, that's you. I think that's. That's, that's yes. That reminds me of a column that I wrote on the 9th of September. This woman said exactly what you said. And that made me. I don't remember the woman's name because she signed her letter at the end of my rope in Schenectady. 
but it was my job to find the words to give her hope. That's what she'd expect from me. So I asked her, who put the wolf in the wolf? It's a wolf. clip of the happy hour um which is which is a lot of fun let's let's take a look at that <laughs> let's see happy hour oh Miami. my god here we come it's happy hour how about a tire of whiskey sour they say it calms the nerves at least that's what i've heard perfect with polynesian poo or nerves with struggles day in and day Disappear secrets of 
safe right here. I'll drink to that. I wish there were dirty mics for women. Oh, oh. our girl can go to alone. Yeah, where she wouldn't be thought of as a lady of the night. Right. Yeah, we'll call it filthy friends. Mm. Why can't a girl sit at a bar? Unescorted with a big Cuban cigar. Ah. A crazy Cuban. Oh. Where? No, 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 no. Yeah? Oh, we can use the juice from the can of the pineapples. Right. We've got the rum and the banana liqueur. Oh, right. Ooh, la, 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 a great escape from. Ooh, la, 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 the daily humdrum. Ooh, la, 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 it's happy hour now. We're a cloud. <laughs> oh, my God, Gillian, those safeties. Oh. <laughs> One other, one other part. design I neglected to mention, uh, the projections are by Justin West, who I believe at that time was a student at Pace University. But all the things changing in the window and uh, the splash, pretty splash. brilliant. And pretty Jim, brilliant. don't forget, this was Lauren Lataro's directing debut. She's oh, that's choreographed right. a ton, but Lauren, this was her first time at the helm for both. And boy, uh, just watching the staging, incredible incredible the way she used the tiny amount of space with all of the scenery it was just and incredible. the cooking she had to keep track of what they were cooking yeah. and the timing and oh it's awesome i think the fourth threat in an actor is to be able to deal with all the props and <laughs> <laughs> and then do it and then do tight four-part harmony and be drunk <laughs> oh my god, tight <laughs> harmony and be drunk. There, yep. <laughs> that was oh, awesome. What a I'm ride. Proud, I'm proud of everybody. I'm proud yeah. of everybody. Really it proud. Was, it was Thanks. an amazing show. Uh, seeing these clips and photographs um, brings it all back. We have a um, testimonial reel that I think is kind of wonderful. Uh, let's take a look at that. We thought the show was incredible. The music was fantastic. The girls were wonderful. I think this could go to Broadway tomorrow. I thought it was so much fun. It was such a great time. Yeah. I, I didn't, you didn't know what to expect when you walked in the door, no. and then you see the set, and it's so bright and lively, and the girls come out, and it's. It's really wonderful. There's four just incredibly talented actresses oh just acting their butts off. Great time. Yeah, great time. fantastic time. Good show. Go see it. I thought it was really, really good. Uh, very upbeat. I love the music. I still have it in my head. Wompy da bomb ba ba da ba dee bomb ba. The show is great. The women were fantastic. And I was there. I have green stamps. I'm thrilled. American theater is definitely doing well this year. It was a wonderful show. And so a young girl growing up in New York, the woman empowerment in the whole show was amazing. And it just changed my life, the, uh, the way I look at the world from now on. If this doesn't make it to Broadway, there's something wrong with this city. And I absolutely didn't want it to end. I thought it was fabulous. I'm so excited. I love this show. Show. I think the girls are amazing. They're talented. The script is fresh. It talks about iconic things from the 60s and the 50s. I loved it. It makes you feel so good, yet it's poignant. It's funny. I just loved it. It's a fabulous show. Everybody should see it. Loved it all. I think all the songs were fantastic. Uh, uh, the acting was fantastic. Uh, and, you know, I tried to pick a favorite part, but I think it was all of them. I give it a 10. It was very danceable. It was very singable. I'm going to buy the album. The, the cast was adorable and incredibly talented. Just what we needed at a time when everything is so crazy to laugh and to remember. It was just perfect. Well, I'm a housewife from the 50s, and I thought it was very authentic. I thought it was beautifully done. The two girls were marvelous, and the props were just so beautiful and so right on. Fantastic, timely, excellent show. I wish I knew then what they know now. <laughs> it was this was probably the best new play I've seen uh, in decades. In decades. Wow, you know what that brought back? Another thing that Holly and I wanted to do. 
was not have it just be a show for older women to look back on. But when that young girl was saying something, that's what we wanted to to bring in the next generation of women that look at that and go, oh my gosh, you know, like we had a lot of young people say to us, did that was it really like right. no. my daughter for 26, you know, they're millennials and they, they were going, come on, that didn't really. And then, and then realizing that that did made them really think about what they took for granted. And boy, when this election happened, they realized what they had taken for granted. Mm. Girls that didn't grow up without the fight. I mean, they just, yeah. I was just thinking the um, awful moment of the election happening on the day of the first or the day before the first preview. What if it had happened in the middle of the run? Hmm. The, the interesting thing was that it colored the entire run this way. If it had happened partway through, it could have been a very different much worse experience. Well, we weren't, this, we weren't think, allowed to change it, right? We weren't have allowed to change the, the line because it's frozen at a certain point. Would we have been allowed to change it? You know, well, we, you, we really couldn't change it. That's what the whole I thing. would have let you. I would have let you change. <laughs> you would have? Equity, equity might not have, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's an interesting. You know, brain part every night, you know? Whoops. It's a line. Does anyone have a closing statement they would like to make before I turn it over to Charles or or um, Jerry Mack? Anyone? Just want to it was. I would love to say it was just. It was just the dream. It was just dream team all around, and timely. I just agree. Yeah. So agree. Thank you. And Jim, thank, thank you. you for bringing us back together. It's so great to see everyone's faces. It's so good to Absolutely. connect, even for this we moment. We have found that this world. series is. This series has such meaning to all the people involved and to the audiences watching. Even people who didn't even see the show saying, oh, what did I miss? Well, now uh, they should license it for their it own helps. theater. Now that we have a black, uh, you know, vice, women vice president, I mean, it's, we can ha generate hope again. I mean, because yes. the story is the same thing, although we can maybe now not, you know, I know when we did it in Chicago, after he had been in office for a couple months, it was really hard to do that ending. And now people want to be more hopeful. And I feel more hopeful now. And it's really great to see it again and how and how relevant it is now too about tolerance, learning to, you know, not only friendship, but tolerance that they were different from different backgrounds and different different secrets and they all came together. Um, anyway, I, I felt very hopeful watching all this again and, and me and seeing everybody. And Jim, it was so nice to see you. So nice to see you. Ollie and Deborah, you mentioned uh, that the show has been the the script has been published by Samuel French, and that it's available for licensing. Um, and Holly, you put a pin in the issue of what that means for the future of the show, or what has been happening. Do you have anything to say about that, or about the uh, your anticipation for uh, uh, the this show's uh, future? Um, personally, I. I'm feeling, I've been feeling more the last couple of months that if theater is starting to come back and I do feel that people have a desire for it, that, that there is a future for this show. And, and I, I do think because of, of everything it says and everything we've all been through, I think it actually has a future again now and, and maybe even more powerful and more fun for everybody. I, I wanna say one thing too that might be interesting that I, when I mentioned that I'm working with a young, a 19 year old artist and the only reason that he, when I first met him that somebody wanted me to mentor him. I've been mentoring some kids too, by the way, but so, and he listened to the, the some music from from A Taste of Things to Come. Now remember he's 19 and his, this was his grandparents' music. But anyway, when he was listening, I said, well, so what did, it, what did it remind you of the 1950s? Cause he loves that kind of music. And he said, well, that first song cooking reminded me of Chuck Berry, but it was girls singing. And that's exactly Chuck Berry Boom. was who Deb was for, and he's 19, which means that there's some love for that music still out there. Yeah. Yes, yes. I think this has the potential to speak to lots of people on lots of levels. Charles, uh, final statement of any kind? Jerry Mack? All I have to say is, I'm sorry, I missed it. It's so good. <laughs> that's the only thing. Maybe you want to do your own production. I was going to say we have yeah. to see. We'll, we'll have to see it now. We'll have to make sure you see yeah, it. Yeah, now I have to see it. Yes. So when we come back, that's the first thing on my list. Okay. Yes. Um, 
thank you all very much. Uh, it's run wonderful revisiting the show and visiting with all of you. Um, thank you all for being a part of this. It's been great revisiting this with you. To all those watching and those on the panel, a warm virtual hug of gratitude. Thanks to all of our special guests, without whom none of us would be here. Thank you, Jerry Mack. Thank you, Charles. And thanks so much to all on the panel. Much appreciation to the entire York Theatre Company staff who all, in one way or another, made this event happen. And pushing buttons behind the scenes and admirably pulling the cast, actually two casts together, but that's another story. Our creative consultant, Hans Friedrichs. Another essential cog in bringing these conversations to you is our artistic associate at the controls as we speak, navigating the Zoomscape, Fiona Sweeney. Very special thanks to the very talented Matthew Gurren for his superb editing. If you enjoyed this, please consider making a tax deductible contribution to the York Theatre Company to help keep these programs happening. Please click on the link in the chat feature to donate. We all hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation. And now one final musical moment from A Taste of Things to Come. Enjoy. Was it a million years ago? Cause it feels like yesterday. Right here making memories in our own little soiree. We thumb through scenes in magazines, imagine who we'd be. We put our dreams and lay away for the day that we'd break free. In time, we stood the test of time. Isn't it a wonderful world? Every Wednesday afternoon, blending the bitter and the sweet. It was over much too soon. All the bits and pieces, down to every little crumb, was food for thought in retrospect. And a taste of things to come in time. Be Sometimes things take time. In time. Be Sometimes things take time. Secrets just between us. We swore our lips were.
Let's celebrate. <laughs> yes. Let's try them. <laughs> Here's to a taste of things to come. And to being anything we want to be. Mm. Yeah, anything. Maybe even president. Bye.